Somewhere years ago, I, I read about a, a city that had a landfill, a city dump, if you will, and it, it got filled and an enterprising entrepreneur bought it uh, from the city fathers. He went out there and began to haul dirt on top of the garbage and took a bulldozer and spread it out and tamped it down. And after he had covered it with dirt, he laid it out into a subdivision, built streets and curbs and uh, began to build homes and it became a very attractively located uh, and, and beautiful site for homes and young couples moved in, bought those homes and it was a wonderful community and little children were riding around on their tricycles. Everything was fine until after a number of years and then something started to happen. Uh, uh, walls in those houses began to sag and roofs uh, began to uh, sway and cracks and fissures came up and the curbing would break and the subsoil gave way and after a while families moved out and it was deserted and the old timers, uh, they knew what had happened. They knew that, uh, that this, this community was built on garbage. They knew that. And they knew that, that the problem was with the foundation. Now that's what's happened in America. We are trying to build our homes, very frankly, on garbage. We don't understand the truth of God's Word. And one wise man said, when the, when the bottom falls out, maybe you ought to examine the foundation. Profound Truth Simply Stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author, Adrian Rogers. Would you be taking God's Word and finding 1 Peter chapter 3, we're talking today about uh, intimacy in marriage, one Lord, one love. The title of the study today, One Lord, One Love, The Divine Design. The Divine Design. What has God designed for the home? I heard recently about a man who was at breakfast. He was behind the newspaper drinking his coffee paying absolutely no attention to his wife, none whatsoever. She said to him, you sitting there behind that paper, I bet you don't even know what today is. He put the paper down. He said, of course I know what today is. Do you think I have forgotten? So that day, in the middle of the day, she received a beautiful bouquet of roses. Later on during the day, she got a box of chocolates. Later on during the day, the man delivered to her door something very frilly for her to wear at night. And when he got home, the table was set with a beautiful linen tablecloth. There were candelabra on the table, fresh cut flowers, a magnificent meal. And after it was all over, she got from her chair and moved over and took him by the hand looked him in the eyes and said, Sweetheart, I want to thank you for making this the most wonderful Groundhog Day I have ever known. <laughs> I think that we have some men today who need to wake up and to listen. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste or pure conversation coupled or joined with fear. Now, I want to say there's nothing more politically incorrect in the Bible than these two verses. I mean, the, the radical feminists today almost split their spleen to read these verses. Uh, that, that a woman is to be in subjection to her husband. This is totally, totally politically incorrect uh, for a woman to say, I am going to submit myself to my husband. And to make matters worse, uh, some Christian women have difficulty with this because it teaches that a, a wife is to submit herself to her husband even if her husband is not obeying the Word of God. Now, why is this? Well, very simply, God says there must be order in the home. And for there to be order in the home rather than chaos, there must be some head. You've heard me say many times that anything without a head is dead and anything with two heads is a freak. 
And that is true in any organization. It's true anywhere. It's true in the church. It's true in the home. And the husband is the head of the wife. The Bible makes it very clear and very plain. Now, some women think automatically that this means that the Bible teaches that women are inferior. Perish the thought. The Bible does not teach that. Let me give you some verses to put together. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Paul says, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That's very interesting because we see from this verse that uh, having a one over us as our head does not mean that we are inferior. Let me ask you this question. Is God the Son inferior to God the Father? Of course not. Is God the Father the head of God the Son? Of course He is. That's what this Scripture teaches. There is a divine order. God the Father, God the Son, the man, and the woman. But is a woman equal with a man? Of course she is. Listen to this Scripture. Galatians 3, verse 28, Neither is there Jew, or there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That is, in Christ Jesus, uh, we're all one. Uh, it took as much of the blood of Jesus to save a woman as it does a man, and when they're saved, they're all part of the body of Christ. But the devil today is trying to obliterate the difference between the sexes. And uh, it is the devil's attempt to make men and women alike under the guise of making them equal. They are equal, but they are not alike. They are different, and God made us different that God might make us one. Never forget that. The Bible is against uh, she men and he women. We're going to talk one whole session about the difference between the sexes. It, 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 <laughs> we're going to have a, a good time that day. We talk about the difference between the sexes. The battle of the sexes really ought not to be a battle at all. As a matter of fact, God made us different that he might make us one. Now look, if you will, in verses 3 and 4. Uh, whose adorning, that is, whose beauty, let it not be that outward adorning of the plaiting of, of hair, uh, uh, plaiting the hair, or wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man or the hidden person of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Underscore that phrase, that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, modesty. Modesty is a trait that says, I have self-confidence. But uh, immodesty says, I am self-centered, self-centered. So a woman is to have a serene uh, beauty about her. She is to have an adornment of serenity. God calls it that, that ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, that which is not corruptible. Now, let me tell you something, ladies. You ought to keep yourself attractive for your husband. But your greatest beauty is inward beauty. And if you don't realize that, you are fighting a losing battle. I'm going to tell you the truth, and you listen to me. My wife is more beautiful to me today than she was when I married her. I mean that with all of my heart. God is listening to what I'm saying. Because of the, the character of that woman, because of the beauty of that woman. And that beauty is internal beauty as well as external. And she gets more beautiful day by day as she walks before the Lord. But if you put all your eggs in the basket of physical beauty, I'm going to tell you what you catch him with is what you're going to have to keep him with. And before long, you know, there's a new bevy of beauties being born every day. Did you know that? Uh, <laughs> they say that uh, beauty is skin deep, ugly goes all the way to the bone. <laughs> beauty fades, but ugly holds its own. Now, <laughs> What, I, what I'm trying to say to you is this, folks, that, that God says she is to have an attitude of submission. She is to have an adornment of serenity. And no woman, listen carefully, no woman with a rebellious spirit can have an adornment of serenity. It's just absolutely impossible. 
possible. Now here's a third thing. Not only her attitude of submission, not only her adornment of serenity, but her affirming speech, her affirmation of speech. Look in verse 6 of this same thing. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Already he said in, in uh, verse 1 that a uh, wife is not to nag her husband. And now she talks about Sarah who called Abraham Lord. Now that doesn't mean Lord like we use the word Lord today. She didn't mean that you are my Lord and Master and she groveled at his feet. But the word Lord was a respect, a, a, a term of respect like uh, we might use the word sir uh, today. But the point is that she spoke very respectfully of her husband. She was very wise in her use of speech. And, and God knows that a woman is, is to a man what a wind is to a fire. She can fan him up or blow him out. Uh, she, by her speech, her words. Do you know what a man wants from a woman? Ladies, let me tell you what a, a man wants from a woman. He wants her admiration. That's what you say. Well, that's what women want from men. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But he wants her to admire him. From the time I first started dating Joyce, I always wanted her to admire me. I used to get on my bicycle and ride backward down the street in front of her house uh, so she, she would come out and see me doing those hijinks. I don't know whether I really enjoyed playing football or not. I mean, it hurts. I get tired. We always talk about the fun of the game. Really, it's not that much fun. <laughs> the fun part is to hold the cheerleader's hand after the game and let her look up at you and ask, are you hurt? You know, no. And, and that, that's, that's the fun part. I have a picture. One of the best pictures that I have is a picture of Joyce. She was in her cheerleader outfit. And by the way, uh, her cheerleader outfit in those days didn't look like they're doing these days, if you want to know. But underneath that, that, that picture of her are these words. It's one of my cherished possessions. She said, I will always cheer you on. That's meaningful to me. Uh, uh, words of affirmation, her affirming words. I wish I had more time for that, but uh, let me go on. And, and the last thing is her accommodating service. Look, if you will, in verses 5 and 6. It talks about Sarah in verse 5 and verse 6. It says she obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Uh, to obey literally means to pay close, close attention to his needs. And uh, a woman ought to ask herself, what can I do to be a help meet to my husband, to meet his needs physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every way? Well, I must leave that because I want to get to God's design for the man. Most sermons on the home, we start on the women and we never get to the man. So let's go on to verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands. Now, I'm glad that's there. Now, ladies, don't sit and say it. Don't say we never got to it. We're going to say more. God requires far more of the man than he does the woman. Listen to it. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, what this says is that men, we're to wise up. We're to dwell with them according to knowledge. And very frankly, that's hard. And you have to watch a man who says he understands women because he'll lie about anything. <laughs> it's hard. The, uh, this literally happened last uh, Friday night. I was driving out here to this area, and I got behind a pickup truck. And it had a bumper sticker, and I got up close to read the bumper sticker. And here's what the bumper sticker said on that pickup truck. This literally happened last Friday night. It said, the more I learn about women, the more I love my truck. <laughs> the more I learn about women, the more I love my truck. I said, well, that's a frustrated guy driving that, that truck. I want to tell you something, folks. The more you learn about Jesus, the more you love your wife. That's what the bumper sticker ought to say. The more I learn about Jesus, the more I love my wife. The Bible says that we are to dwell with them according to knowledge. Men are sometimes are so stupid. You think because you're the head of the home, you're superior. The theory of male, I knew a man that... Uh, subscribed to the theory of male superiority until his wife canceled his subscription. <laughs> One of 
what is a man to be? Well, first of all, he is to be the provider in the home. The man is to be the provider in the home. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, God said very clearly that it was the man's job to dress and to keep the vineyard, the Garden of Eden. It is the man's job to bring in the basic necessities to the home, food, clothing, transportation. Now, if not, if, it, if the man does not assume that basic responsibility, there's going to be a loss of respect. We have many women today who are working outside the home who do not need to work outside the home, especially when there are little children at home. But they do that for, for, for fulfillment. We're going to talk about that uh, later on in this, uh, in this series. A lot of homes would be much happier if we learned to do with less. And I want to remind you what I said when we spoke on the Ten Commandments, what a Greek philosopher said when he said, to whom little is not enough, nothing is enough. If you can't learn to get along on little, you'll never be satisfied with much. Now, when a husband is to provide, and by the way, my, my hat is off and my heart is out to women who have to work to, to provide the basic necessities. But if you, if you do work and you don't have to provide the basic necessities and you work outside the home, let what the man earns go for the basic necessities and what you earn, let it be used for ministry and, uh, and the extras in the family if necessary. And sometimes uh, we cannot have this idea of sometimes a woman has to work, and I know that. I know that. But I'm telling you that God's divine design is for the man to be the provider in the home. He is to be the provider. Now, you're to provide for your wife, sir, more than the food and clothing, however. You're to meet her emotional needs. The Bible says you're to give her honor. That's one of the things you're to give her. Let me just read very quickly the seven basic emotional needs of your wife. Number one, she needs the stability and direction of a spiritual leader. If you're not a spiritual leader, you're not providing for your wife. Number two, she needs to know that she and she alone is meeting the basic needs of your life that no other woman can meet. That is, she needs to know beyond a shadow of a doubt she is number one in your life so far as people are concerned. Number three, she needs to see and learn that you delight in her, that you cherish her as a person, not as a, se a sex object, but as a person. Number four, she needs to know that you enjoy setting aside quality time for intimate conversation with her. She wants you to sit down, look her in the face, and give her intimate time. Number five, she needs to know that it is the goal of your life to protect her in areas of her limitations. That is, you recognize that she is the weaker vessel. Number six, she needs to know that you are aware of her presence even when you're doing other things, that you don't ignore her. Number seven, she needs to know that the goal of your life is to invest in her life to help her to expand and fulfill her world. You say, Pastor Rogers, I couldn't get all of those things down. Well, come back at 11, I'll give it again, or else uh, get the tape. But what I'm trying to say is this, that a husband is to be a provider for his wife. But not only is he the provider, listen very carefully, he is the protector. Because what did God tell Adam to do? Not only to dress the garden, but he was told to keep it. He was told to keep it. And that word keep means he is to guard it. The husband is to shield his family. He is to guard his family. He is to defend his family. I want to say that men are to protect their families. The husband is the provider. He is the protector. And the husband is the pastor of the home. This verse goes on to say that husbands are to dwell with wives according to knowledge that, that their prayers be not hindered. Whose prayer is he talking about? Well, I, he may be talking about the prayer of husband and wife together, but beyond the shadow of any doubt, he's talking about the prayer of the man of God. Do you know what my job, my assignment from God is? 
My assignment from God is to love Joyce as Christ loved the church. And how does Jesus love the church? The Bible says that he loved it this way, that he gave himself for it, that he might present it to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Do you know what spots are? That's defilement. I am to keep my wife from defilement. Do you know what wrinkles are? Do you know what a wrinkle is? It's an inward scar. Do you know why women have such tension in their lives? Because their husbands have not loved them as the husband ought to love them. Have you ever, have you ever walked up to a woman and seen that tension on her face? Many times the husband put it there. Many times uh, he has not removed those, uh, those inward scars by his love. My chief assignment from God is to make Joyce a more radiantly beautiful Christian. I am, I have this God-given assignment. I am to be provider, protector, and pastor in the home. Not because I'm a pastor. If I, if I were a lawyer or a businessman or whatever, it's still my assignment to be the pastor in the home. I'm to say, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Now, folks, this is just the design. This is not how to have intimacy. We're going to get to how to have intimacy in the next several messages. But what I'm trying to do today is just to lay down the divine design for you to see what God says that a wife is to be, what God says that a husband is to be. Now, if you don't agree with what God says there in 1 Peter, don't come and talk to me about it. Just tell God about it, okay? Just say, God, you're wrong about this, but don't come to me about it. Now, if I've misinterpreted the Scripture, you come to me and say, you didn't say it just right. You didn't read it right. You didn't interpret it right. And here's where you can be more correct. But don't come to me and say, this is what God says, but I don't agree with it because I'm not going to change and God's not going to change. You're the one who needs to change. And if you want to have a, a godly home, go back and read the directions. God has a plan. Now, let me just wrap this up by saying this. You cannot have a Christian home without having Christians any more than you could have a cherry pie without cherries. And if you want God in your home, then you've got to give your heart to God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one stirring, no one looking around. Lord God, I pray today that many will give their hearts to Jesus and be saved. And I pray, dear God, that those of us who are saved will begin to read your word and to build our homes solidly on your word. In the name of Jesus, amen.